We were in 2 Timothy last week. We're in 2 Timothy again, and we'll probably stay there. And this morning, as we do talk about finishing the task, I hope everyone had a good week. It's a beautiful day to be able to worship the Lord. I see no visitors really today, so pray for your pastor. Hopefully he will be here in, in March, and uh, we're excited about it. I know you're excited about it as well, and hopefully we'll be able to do some great work in the community as uh, God continues to provide leadership for this church. But 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we'll be. And before we read that, let me just uh, ask you a couple of questions as we do study God's Word this morning, and that is this. Have you ever not finished a task? Oh. <laughs> by, by the laughs, I guess, that uh, we have all not finished the task that we have. And so I was able to meet with over uh, 20 pastors this week. And the pastors all got together basically for encouragement. And it was, you know, we're ministers. It's tough sometimes. Sometimes we don't get the chance to be able to really debrief. Sometimes we don't get the chance to be able to talk about our hurts and our, our pains that are going on in our life. But these pastors were able to get together and be able to refocus. And sometimes we do need to, to refocus in our lives to finish the task that God has called us to do. For some of us, we just really need to have some encouragement to finish whatever God has for our family. And some of us have some family issues. Some of us have some family structures. We get burdened down by those family issues sometimes. But maybe we just need to go back and ask God, God, how can we finish making my family a family that serves you? I love what Joshua says. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Sometimes we need to go back and say, as a family, are we serving the Lord? Some of us, it may be for work. We just need to say, God, you called me to this job. I don't know why you called me this job. Sometimes I don't like it, but yet you have provided me an income. You have a reason for me being at this job. And sometimes we've got to reevaluate that and say, God, what is it that you want me to finish while I'm here? We know that most people will change jobs seven times in their life. So you're probably not going to have the same job your entire life. My mom has been at the same job now, I believe, for 30-something years. It amazes me because I've changed so many jobs by then, and my mom still is 35 years strong at her place. But God has a purpose for us there. What is that purpose? And let's finish that purpose. Some of us may just be trying to, to have a great relationship with our neighbor that we've never really had. I know I, I get to walk around the neighborhoods a lot, and we see these signs in people's yards now that keep your dog off my property. And some of you may not like your, your neighbors right now because their dog continues to use the bathroom in your yard as they walk. But some of us may need to go back and have a reconciliation time with our neighbor and say, you know what, we've got to move past this. We've got to move past uh, being able to, to share our faith with each other. We've got to be able to share our life with each other. Some of us may just need to finish that. But what about in our Christian faith? And here's where I want us to, to really start talking. What is it that God has called us to do that maybe we promised Him and we never finished it? Is there something in your life that you can say, Wow, God, I, I promised to do this and I promised and, and it just never happened. And so hopefully we can flesh that out this morning. We can look at it through God's Word because Timothy is in the same situation. I don't mind uh, telling you a little bit about my life, so I'm going to tell you some of the things that I have never finished in the Christian faith that uh, I should have finished. And so now I'm reevaluating my life, and uh, one of those things was at uh, 23 years old, I started seminary, and I never finished my Greek class. So as a, a pastor in training, you're supposed to take two years of Greek, and I waited all the way to the last part of seminary, and I never finished those Greek classes. So 13 years later, at 36, I'm having to learn the Greek language. But I want to finish. I want to finish well what God called me to do. I want to be able to, to read God's Word in its original language and be able to, to be able to share what it is as we bring God's Word out. So that's mine. Is right now I want to finish 13 years of neglect of finishing a Greek class. I also want to do this. I, I've, I've been looking in my, my house and I've got books and books and books. I don't know about you, but I go to the bookstore and I just look around and say, man, all these are great books. I want to read this one. And I grab it. 
And then at the end of the year, I look back and I say, man, I've got 20, 30 books that I bought and I didn't finish any of them. The titles were great. The, the messages were great. So I have two totes now full of books that I'm having to get rid of so I can finish three books this year. And these are the three books that I want to finish. I want to finish a book on time management. Our pastors are struggling right now as uh, we move into bivocational ministries. Most of our pastors now, specifically here um, in, in the Hawaiian Islands, but also out west as we start more churches, is most pastors are going to be bivocational. And we've got to figure out how we manage our families, how we manage our other jobs, how we manage the church. And so for me, I had to get rid of about 60 books to say I need to finish a book on time management to help our pastors. Also, a book on sales. You may be saying, Brian, you're in, in the ministry. Why do you need to read a book on sales? And here's the reason why we need, to, we need to study outside of Scripture sometimes. And that is because in sales, we're trying to give people something that they need. We're trying to convince them that you need this. And so sometimes in, and as we're spreading the gospel, we may not be communicating what they need. And so I'm going to read a book on sales to be able to present the gospel in a better way, hopefully, that will meet their needs. And so I could come to someone right now and I could share my faith with them. And let's say that they're having family issues, uh, but I'm sharing about being single, what, what it means to be single in the faith, and I'm not meeting their needs. So I've got to be able to, to go back and look at sales and be able to present the gospel in a better way. Also, a book on leadership. I, I hate to say this, but my generation of 30 to 40-year-olds, it's already come out, all the studies are already showing, that we will serve and we will give more than any other generation in the church. The problem is, is no one knows how to lead us. And so I'm, I'm looking at ways for us to be able to share with pastors, how do you lead that generation of 30 to 40 year olds that want to serve more than anyone, that want to give more than anyone, but our problem is don't waste our time. And so these, this next year, you can hold me accountable. Those are the three things that I need to finish what I know God has called me to do. And that is to read those three books and finish the Greek language. So I've confessed to you what I know for a fact that God has called me to do. Will you confess to someone in your life, I need to finish. And I need to finish well. Because that's what we're seeing in this book that Timothy is being written to. In this letter that Paul is. Paul is basically telling Timothy, it's time to finish the job. And so as we study these passages this morning... Maybe there's things in your life that you want to finish. Maybe you haven't tithed in a long time. You say, oh, pastor's bringing up giving again. Well, maybe it's because we don't know where our money's going. Maybe we need to pray and we need to say, God, show me how to create a budget so that I can make sure that I'll know where all my money's going and be able to give you the money that you've asked me to do. Maybe some of us haven't shared our faith in such a long time that we don't even know who to share with. And so maybe we just need to get a prayer plan who do we pray for? And then not only just pray for them, that when God brings them on our mind, that we do have a plan. How am I going to share my faith with them? For some of us, it may mean that you just need to call someone and pray with them. Now, I am 100% asking you, please don't be like me. And I'm confessing this this morning, that it's been 15 years since I've called my uncle and prayed with him. 15 years. I, I haven't just called my uncle at all and just said, hey, Uncle Jim, can I, can I pray with you? Well, this week I had to call and pray with him because he's been diagnosed with, with cancer and a real rare form of cancer that, he, um, that he's probably not going to be able, unless the Lord miraculously does it, that he's not going to be able to, to survive it. And so it's taken me 15 years to really just say, God, who should I be able to pray for and why haven't I prayed for my uncle? Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe that's where you just need to start and say, God, who is it that you've put on my mind that I haven't followed up with? They just need a word of encouragement. They just need a word of prayer from me. And I need to be there to, to be able to uh, lift them up, lift their spirits up. So today, if there is one motto that we have, if there's one topic that we can really say that this message is about, and that's finish. We talk about it on sports teams all the time. Finish the job. Finish well. Finish the game. Finish what you started. We talk about it in business. Let's finish the project. Let's finish our task. But we also talk about it in life, don't we? And that's what Paul is going to tell Timothy. And Paul tells him, I'm finishing. Timothy, you're just starting. What do you need to put in your life 
to make sure that you finish this race. So if you'll read with me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Now, I don't have time for us to be able to, to go in-depth with all of these verses. So you go home with your family, with your neighbor, and just look over these verses. There is so much in these little eight verses that you can apply to your life. And this is what it says. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead. And because of His appearing and His kingdom... Proclaim the message, persist in it, whether convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. They will turn away from the hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, be serious about everything. Endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me in the future the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord. The righteous judge will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have loved His appearing. Will you pray with me? Father, as we look at your word this morning, we go ahead and confess. Sometimes, Father, we don't finish what we've promised you. Father, sometimes we don't finish what you've called us to do. But this morning, help us to evaluate our life. As we see Paul basically on his, his deathbed and just pouring everything out to Timothy. And as Paul is finishing what you called him to do. And he's telling Timothy, it's your turn. You're the next person. Father, I pray we look at our lives. We evaluate our lives. Say, God, where is it that you want to glorify yourself in our life that we haven't finished? Father, encourage us this morning. Motivate us this morning. Challenge us this morning. Father, bring about unity in the church because you want us to finish So, Father, I just pray that you speak through your words this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just real, real quick, remembering why this letter is written. And this letter is written for Christian leaders to be reminded to don't be ashamed of the gospel. It may bring out hardships in our life. Last week it may bring out struggles. But we don't become ashamed of it. That this is what God has called us to do. But He's also not just called us to do it. He's entrusted us. He has given us a task. Specifically for each and every one of us in here. It's unique to you. Just you. God said, I want you to be the person that does this for me. I want you to be the person that is being shown to the world so that I can be glorified. We're reminded. From Paul to Timothy, you're entrusted with what God has given us, and that is the gospel. The gospel to bring great news. Paul is also in prison, and Paul is writing basically his last will and testament. And he's basically saying, I'm done. My job's over. Timothy, wake up. Timothy, like last week, fan the flame. Timothy, finish. And so he's writing these things so that we can be encouraged today that when we go through obstacles, when we go through trials, that we don't walk away from the faith and say, God, it's too difficult. God, it's too hard. But we can say with our last breath, God, I gave it to you. God, thank you for letting me live this life. God, thank you for choosing me to entrust me to present your gospel. But he also is this. As Paul thought that he would die, so he taught about grace, he taught about heaven, and he taught about hope in this letter. And as Paul is talking about these things in this letter, we've got to put ourselves in the context of Paul in prison, pouring his life out 
to one man, and that was Timothy. Hopefully, we can look at it and we can be encouraged. So let's break these verses down. And as we break these verses down this morning, let's put ourselves in the position of Timothy. Timothy did not want to be there. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be the first one to tell you, sometimes when God calls me to travel, I don't want to be there. I don't. I was asked again this week, when are you coming back to Oahu? And I said, hopefully not in a long time. I don't. When I was in Samoa, it was, when are you coming back to Hawaii? I don't want to come to Hawaii. I'll be the first. I don't like traveling. I don't. And if because I don't like traveling, then I all, all of a sudden always get to travel. And God thinks it's funny that, hey, I'm going to take you somewhere else. You know, it, it just it is what it is. So as we do look in these verses this morning, the first thing that we're going to look at is, I solemnly charge you. Look at that real quick. I'd be, be honest with you, you know, I don't know Greek. And the first time I took Greek, I, I failed it because of the English language part of it. I didn't fail the Greek part, I failed the English part. So I looked up solemnly. And I was like, what in the world does solemnly mean? And this is what it means. It's formally and dignified with deep sincerity, with the utmost seriousness. And so Paul is telling Timothy, this is the top. There's nothing more serious than what I'm about to write to you. Nothing. And he puts it in a perspective of a king telling his servants, telling his people, this is what's important. And if I ever, I always ask the Lord, why didn't I ever get to live in, in the time of kings and queens? I love it. Absolutely love it. If there's a movie out that's about a king and a queen and a, and a, a knight and a soldier, I want to be in it. I do. I love Loyalty. Love loyalty. And to know that these people would just, all of a sudden, just say, the king would say, do it. Now, it was obviously a great king. If it was a bad king, they wouldn't do it. But if it was a good king, they said, yes, I will lay my life down for the throne. And as we see God here in this position, it's God's looking out at His people and He's saying, I've got a job. I've got a task. And Paul is saying, I solemnly charge you. It's like a king telling his people, this is what is for the kingdom. This is the only thing that's important. And Paul is telling that to Timothy. And he's telling him, finish. And over and over, we see in the scripture, God telling his people, finish, finish, finish. And I can imagine standing before the throne of God and God saying to to me personally Brian it's your time I have created you for a time as this and we see here that he says I solemnly charge you why? because Timothy wanted to quit Timothy wanted to walk away we looked at it a little bit last week Timothy didn't want to have to teach older people Timothy didn't want to have to defend the faith Timothy basically said, I'm going home. And Paul tells Timothy, you're not going home. You're staying. And I love it because that's basically what Pastor Elise did to me. Pastor, I want to leave American Samoa. No, you're going to finish why God called you here. And once He's finished with you, then you can leave. And I love that when He trains pastors as well. God called you to be a pastor, finish the job of being a pastor. God called you to lead a Bible study, finish the job of leading the Bible study. And that's all Paul is telling Timothy. You're not quitting. How many of us in our life need that today? That we can have a mentor, or we can have an accountability partner that can come up to us and we can say, with the greatest sincerity, with the greatest seriousness, you will finish what God has called you to do. And so many of us, we get discouraged. We say, God, pick someone else. God, this task is too difficult. And yet we see here a man on his deathbed saying, we're going to finish what God has called us to do. Let's look at the next part in verse 1. This is what it says. Before God in Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead. Now, we have to look at what it means to judge here. So, 
So first and foremost, we see that there is a seriousness to finish the task. And we see now that what is it to judge? And there are two types of judgments in the New Testament. The first judgment is the one that we know about where you'll stand before God. He'll open the book of life. You're either in it or you're not in it. If you're not in it, the Bible says you'll be cast out into the lake of fire. If you're in it, you'll be with God forever. Plain and simple. We can't get past that. We looked at that last week. We've got to teach the whole gospel. There is a judgment that is coming. The second judgment is for God's people. And that judgment is we will stand before God and give an account for our task, what we did. And we see in the, test, uh, in the New Testament writings that God rewards people differently. And He rewards you on how you finished or how we finished. It also says that He will judge the church on how we finished. So that's the judgment that we're talking about here. That Paul is telling Timothy, I solemnly charge you because God is the judge. It's this whole kingship thing. He gets to make whatever rules he wants to make. It's just part of it. The great thing about it is looking at the New Testament and we see that God works out all things for those that love Him. So we don't have a king that's sitting up there in judgment waiting to strike us down as believers and say, oh, you're not good enough anymore. We know that through Jesus Christ that none of us were good enough and we are just blessed to be in God's kingdom through what Christ did on the cross. So, I went back and thought to myself, I don't know if you heard this growing up, but I heard this a lot. Oh, you better not do that. God's watching. We just had this warped mentality of, man, God's just, God's just looking to strike me down anytime. Every, every time I do something wrong, I was terrible. Terrible. I was, I was talking to someone uh, a couple of weeks ago. Why didn't you do Boy Scouts? And it was, uh, well, I did do Boy Scouts, but uh, my mom kind of figured out that me and my twin brother weren't going to be in Boy Scouts when me and my twin brother locked the, the guy out of, out of our meeting. So the, our, our head person or whatever can't even come to the meeting because my brother and I decided that it was, it was best for us to lock him out. So I know for a fact that I'm not good. I know that. But as we look at these verses here, and we look at the judgment, what is it that Paul is trying to tell Timothy? And that is this. You're going to give an account for walking away. Timothy, if you walk away from this, if you quit, you're going to give an account. So how does that make us think then and how we relate to God that knowing that God is not waiting and willing to just strike us down for us that are believers? He's not. But knowing that He is watching everything that we do, does it put us in a new perspective that we will be judged for that? That if God has called us to do something and we don't complete it, we will not be rewarded for it. Some of us may just be saying, and Paul, Paul addresses this, that some of us just want to be saved to get, a, get out of the fire. But I hope that's not our intent. God just saved me so I don't go to hell. But it really then becomes, instead of us having the mentality of me as a child, of, oh, God's watching, that really we look at it and we say, no, God's watching and He's a God full of grace. And He's a God full of mercy. That if I didn't do it the first time, that God is going to give me the ability, if I confess that, to do it the second time. That He didn't just write us off. And so many believers that I talk with say, Brian, if you only knew my past, you would know that I can't serve at the church. No. If God has forgiven you, God has removed the sin from your life, He wants to use you. Period. And just as Paul is telling that to Timothy, a man that is so discouraged, that's willing to walk away from the faith, how much more then is God saying to us as a church today that bears His name, finish the task. I'm full of grace. I'm full of mercy. Yes, you may be heartbroken. Yes, you may be willing to walk away. But today is a new day. And we confess it to the Lord. And we say, Lord, I didn't do it. But give me that opportunity again. Give me that chance again. And please, like I said, don't be 15 years waiting to call your uncle just to pray with him. What about our neighbors are the same? God may have been telling us the entire time over the last 10, 15, 20 years that our neighbors... And the only time we reached out to him was when it was at desperation. 
when really God wants us to share our life with people. That's why He left us here. I want to, see, I want to read you two verses. Why I believe that it's important for us to know that God is watching us. And God cares about every choice that we make. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God doesn't want to throw us away if we messed up. God doesn't want to throw us away if we haven't finished the task. God has already told us we are His ambassadors. He put His name on us. We represent Him to our community. And if we're not doing that, then we need to confess that. We need to say, God, I want to finish because you put your name on me. There's nothing greater than wearing our, our football jerseys or, or wearing our sports uniforms because there's only so many people. I went to a, a school of about 2,000 people and there were 50 people on the football team. That was it. There were only 20 people on the wrestling team. But you got to wear the jersey. You got to bear the name. How much more for us as believers that we get to bear His name? He has wrote His name upon us. He has called us His ambassadors. He hasn't thrown us away and said, forget you. You're not good enough. What He's saying is, I've got a task for you. And I want you to finish that task. Acts 1.8 says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. You don't think God wants us to be a part of it? He put His name on us and said, you be my ambassador wherever I send you. If it's at home, it's at home. If it's on the other side of the island, it's on the other side of the island. If it's for me sometimes having to travel to a different island, so be it. But God has called us to be ambassadors. What is the charge that we're supposed to be doing? What is the job that God gave Paul and then Paul gave it to Timothy and then Timothy writes it to us or talks about it in his letter? And that is this. Proclaim the message. I'm in verse 2. Proclaim the message... Persist in it, whether convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. First thing, we proclaim the message. If we wake up in the morning and say, God, I don't know what you want me to do today, proclaim the message. That's our, always our fallback plan. Proclaim the message. But well, what is the message? Chapter 1 tells us. That's why when we read Scripture, we've got to make sure that we read it in the context of which it was written. Chapter 1 tells us what is the message that we are to be proclaiming. That is this. Jesus saved us not on our works, but according to His grace. He abolished death and has brought life. There is a heaven and it's real. That's the plain and simple message. We can't work at for our salvation. We can't. Not by works. By grace. Through faith. In Jesus Christ. The second thing is heaven's real. There is a judgment. There's a judgment for the living. There's a judgment for the dead. There's a judgment for God's people. Preach the word. Proclaim the word. It doesn't change. It's always the same. I love that about the Bible. We don't have to wake up in the morning and go, God, what is the message? We already have God's revelation. He has already told us that. We don't have to come up with a new thing. I know as I read books on time management right now, I'm going to have to develop a curriculum. In the Bible, we have the message. It is by grace that you are saved through faith. Also, as we are proclaiming God's message, what does it say? Persist in it. Once again, finish. Persist in the message, whether convenient or not. Let's be real. There are some times in our life when it's convenient to preach the gospel. Somebody comes to us and they say, you would not believe what I did. I just need help. I need forgiveness. And basically, they just come and they, they know that you're a believer and then they just throw themselves at you and they say, help me get through this. And that's pretty easy when that happens. But when it's not easy, is when we can't figure out when we have enough time to walk across the street. We can't figure out what our neighbor is going to say 
if we do share our faith with them. So Paul is telling Timothy, hey, there are going to be times when sharing the gospel is easy. But there are also going to be times when it's not easy. That doesn't mean that we don't do it. That means that we finish even more. That we persist even more. And I love the word persist because you have to accomplish something. You have to fight through something. I started running again. Remember I shared with you last week that uh, many people think I'm healthy and I'm not healthy. Remember the nice little pills that I take for, for blood pressure? Well, I started running this week. And right when I got out there, I took about two minutes and I said, I'm done. It's hot. And I want to go home. And you know what? When you finish, you know how good it feels when you finish? And then I woke up the next day and my mind was like, it's time to go run real quick. And I said, no, no mind, it's not good. Nobody, it's not good to run. And I went and did it again. And you know what happened when it was over with? It was great. And then the third day came. And my mind woke me up and it said, it's time to go run. And I argued with my body again. No, it's not. You know how much pain you're going to be in. And my legs have been killing me for the last couple of days. And then I told my mind, I said, you know what, I'm going to give myself a break on Sunday. But what's going to happen tomorrow? You're going to wake up again and let's persist in it. And it's the same thing that Paul is telling Timothy. It hurts. It's not fun. But man, when you're done, knowing that God was glorified, knowing God was pleased with you, man, it feels good. Knowing that the king that saved us says, well done, man, what a feeling. There's no other greater feeling. There's no greater thing in our life knowing that God is pleased with us knowing that He chose us for a specific call and we finished that. I'm going to start speeding up real quick. So take, take as many notes as you possibly can because I'm running out of time. And remember, I watch myself on YouTube and sometimes it's just, we're going to speed up. <laughs> we're going to speed up. All right? The next, the next part. The next part is this rebuke. What does it mean to rebuke? And this is the thing I believe that we do have sometimes as a concern for all believers. And that is this. We won't tell people when they've made a mistake. Oh, it's not my business to tell them when they've made a mistake. But we see here that Paul is telling Timothy, you made a mistake. And he's rebuking him. And so basically when we look at rebuke, we are allowed to show disapproval for people's actions. We are. The Bible tells us as believers to hold each other accountable. Now, there are ways to do this. We see it in Matthew, where in the, one of the most quoted verses is when two or more people are gathered together, uh, God is there. That's for rebuking people. That's not for us just to say, okay, well, when we come together, we're going to have a great and joyous time. No, the rebuke, that's for rebuking. Read the entire thing. And it's a challenge to the church. Make sure that we are making it through these things. And so when we rebuke people, yes, there are ways. If you want church to look at church discipline, please ask me and we'll, we'll go over it. But that's what that rebuke is right there. It's showing disapproval to other believers and telling them, that's not right. And my gosh, what if Paul didn't tell Timothy, that's not right. You can't walk away from this. We wouldn't have this beautiful letter right now. Correct. Basically, that's just telling somebody, hey, you're in error. This isn't an action that's doing somebody. It's just, hey, I taught something wrong. Well, we use the Word of God to correct them. Plain and simple. We also encourage, and this is something that I think we leave a lot out in Scripture, is encouraging each other. I am so glad that Timothy had an encourager. Barnabas' name in the Greek language is son of encouragement. I love that. What if you were the person that everybody walked around and said, man, I'm so glad they're here. They're going to encourage me today. And so many times we forget in our Christian lives that we're to encourage each other. We're to, as the Bible says, we're to spur each other on. We're to motivate each other. Paul tells Timothy, hey man, fan the flame. Let's go. Get excited about this. And Paul's excited about this in prison. And he's not in one of our jails today. 
He's in one of the jails that beat people, that hated him. So let me ask you this. As we look at verses, as we look at verses 1 and 2, look at verses 1 and 2. Do we truly believe that the truth will set people free? Do we truly believe that? If we do believe that, then we will share it. Because we know so many heartaches and so many things in people's life. And we say, what am I supposed to do, Lord? And really, He said, just tell them the truth. It may hurt right now, but tell them the truth. It will eventually set them free if they trust it. And so our lives must be lives of finishing the task by telling the truth. I'm going to finish with verse 3 and 4, and then I'm going to jump to 6, 7, and 8. Because my gosh, what Paul tells us on his deathbed should be every one of our life's mottos. 3 and 4 says this, and it gives us a reason why we are to rebuke, to correct, to encourage. It tells us this in verse 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. We are in a time where people are not tolerating sound doctrine. Watch this. In the church... Outside the church, you expect it. Inside the church, we are living in days where we are having more theological fights over anything. Why? Because feelings are being hurt. What do you mean you didn't like what I did? What do you mean I can't act like that? Well, the Bible tells you you can't act like that. Well, the Bible is wrong. It's old. There's no way that it could apply to our life 2,000 years later. The truth will either set people free or it doesn't set people free. What is it? And let me say this, church. If it set us free, then it will set somebody else free. Period. If it can change your life, it can change somebody else's life. So three and four is what our churches are facing today. We must stand up, correct, rebuke, encourage, teach, whether it's convenient or not. Let's skip all the way down to verse 6 through 8. Here's the challenge, church. Here's the challenge. Will you finish? Will you go on to be with the Lord this afternoon? Will you get on your knees and you say, God, whatever it is that I have not finished, Father, I want to finish the task. Watch what Paul says here in 6 through 8. Hey, circle this, circle this, and circle this. Every day you wake up this week, read this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time for my departure is close. I love this. I have fought the good fight. Knowing that Paul was shipwrecked. Knowing that Paul was hungry. Knowing that Paul was beaten for dead and left outside the gates. He said, man, I'm done. I fought that. And knowing in a fight, you get punched, you get beat up, you walk away, you're scarred. And Paul is saying, I'm being poured out like a drink offering now. Look what he says in the next part. I have finished the race. Paul's life was not like my run the other day. Two minutes into it, I wanted to quit. Paul's life was, we're finishing this job. Why? Because God gave me grace. God gave me mercy. God forgave me of throwing people in jail. God forgave me of tormenting the church. And now he called me to be his disciple, his ambassador, his disciple, to teach other people. And Paul says, I am finishing the race. Why? In the future, there is reserved, excuse me, in the future, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul says, I'm not getting any reward here. None. Don't care. Because the day I stand before the Lord is the day He will give me that crown of righteousness. Paul wasn't working to earn it. Paul was working out the grace that God had given him. And he said, Timothy, I'm done. It's your turn. In the Bible, we see that it is our turn. We looked at it two weeks ago. Jesus praying for the church. Praying for unity. Ladies and gentlemen, 
will we finish? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for calling. We thank you for choosing. And Lord, we'll be honest with you. We're walking away here this morning going, what do you have for me today? And some of us may be saying, God, please don't call me to do that, knowing that you've already called us to do that. So through the Holy Spirit, through other believers, Father, encourage us. Even Paul asked, pray for me. Well, Father, we're praying for each other that we will stand before your throne just as Paul said, with confidence, I have finished. Father, we plead to you, whatever it is in our life that is not allowing us to finish, Father, I pray we can go home today and we can confess that to you to remove it. Father, we look for that crown of righteousness that will be given to all those who have loved your appearing. Father, we pray you make this appeal today. Help us finish. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand, we will close in song.